Glory to his name. Today I want to talk to you about the grace of God. When grace is enough. One of the great questions of the Bible is what was Paul the Apostle's thorn in the flesh? He writes about this experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Many theories have been offered. Some suggest it was a physical illness. Others say it was false apostles undermining the work of the ministry. Some say it was critics saying that Paul wasn't a real apostle because he wasn't one of the original 12 Jesus chose. And some have even suggested that he had a problematic marriage. Maybe that's why he spent so much time on the road. <laughs> what his thorn was is not nearly as important as what he did about it. And what can you do when you have a thorn in your flesh? He says it was a thorn. Now, thorn is very painful, but it's not that problematic. It's more of an irritation, but it, it's not life-threatening. So whatever it was, was just a thorn, but it was enough to irritate him and distract him and discourage him. He says, it was in my flesh. In other words, it was personal. It could be his mind. It could be his body. But it was affecting him on a personal level. Then he says it was a messenger of Satan. It was a spiritual problem. Was it some type of a spiritual assault? Was it a false apostles who he also writes about in this letter and says that they masquerade as angels of light? He saw it as coming as a spiritual attack against him and against his ministry. And he says it was given to keep him from come, becoming conceited. In other words, Paul found a purpose for it. It helped whatever it was keep his feet grounded so that he stayed in need of God and came to the place of the sufficiency of God's grace to the point that he could say, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And what can you do when you have a thorn in your flesh, a personal problem, a marriage problem, a health problem, a business problem? Well, the first thing we learn about Paul is the action he took. You see, when you're faced with a thorn in your flesh, the action you take is very important. He said, I pleaded with the Lord three times. Not prayer is a last resort. Prayer is the first option. He said, I pleaded with the Lord. Now, that word, paraclis in the Greek, to call for help, to summon urgently for help. And the most important thing you do when you have a thorn in your flesh is you call to the Lord for help. I pleaded three times with the Lord. He didn't say I complained to the Lord. He didn't say I blamed the Lord. He didn't say I told the Lord if you don't take this away, I'm going to quit the ministry. He didn't bargain with the Lord. He pleaded with the Lord. He sought help from the Lord. And I sought it three times. I prayed about it until I got an answer. And the third time God's answer came, my grace is sufficient for you. And he learned that grace was enough. And sometimes when you pray, God, take it away, God says, I'll give you grace to take you through. There's a grace that takes things away and takes us out. And there's also a grace that takes us through. And the most important thing we do when we deal with a thorn in the flesh, 
is plead with the Lord and call to him for help until we get an answer from heaven. Now, prayer is a great mystery. It's something I don't understand how it works, but I know it works. Prayer is a gift God gave us. Prayer and the science of prayer and the law of prayer is as real as the laws of physics. Prayer is a lot like my cell phone, my smartphone. I don't understand how it works. It's been explained to me. I've had the science explained, but I still don't understand that. I don't understand how my phone is also my computer. It is my library. It is a movie theater. It is my stereo. It can do everything but microwave popcorn, and it will be doing that shortly, I think. But I use it. I trust it. It works. I don't really know how it works as many times as you may explain it to me. It still remains shrouded in mystery, the power of light and the laws of physics that make all of that global communication even possible in our world, and yet we know enough to know, well, it works. You can turn it on, and you can use it, and you trust it, and so it is with prayer. You don't have to know everything about prayer, and I could explain it to you all day long, and it will still be enshrouded in the mystery to you. The most important thing for you to know is prayer works, and if you plead with the Lord and call for help, God will give you an answer. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks on the door, it will be open. Who of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? If he asked for fish, would give him a serpent? If you then, Jesus said, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? Will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? I started my ministry out of college as an evangelist for the church denomination in California, preaching all over little churches in Southern California. Came back, met Barbie, got married a few months later, was a youth pastor for 18 months, felt like the Lord told me to leave, had no place to go. Then the Lord opened a door for us to go to Athens and start a new church, a little church that had tried to get started, and the whole thing fell apart. We had one little building, about 8,500 square feet, an old gymnastic building, a metal building. I mean a metal building without insulation and a concrete floor on one acre of land. We had nothing, 12 members. But the church began to grow from the first Sunday we had first-time guests. Every Sunday we had first-time guests. Eight months later, we had over 100 in attendance. The church was growing. We had no place to park people. They were parking in the grass and the mud along the side of the church. There was 1.8 acres next to us, behind us, a 33-acre mobile home park. The men on my leadership team, the elders, one was a professor at the University of Georgia, the head of the risk management department. He and others were really gifted at real estate. They contacted an agent. We found that an investment firm in California owned the trailer park and all the land. So we said, we'd like to buy it. They sent word back, we're not going to sell it. In fact, not only are we not going to sell it, we're about to put a mobile home sales lot on that 1.8 acres on the frontage of 441. And I heard that, and in my heart I said, no, you won't, not next to my church. We negotiated. They had no interest. So I called that small group of elders I had, about seven men. We came early one morning. I said, we're going to walk around this whole 1.8 acres, and we're going to claim. I read in Joshua, I'll give you every place you set your foot. So I'm going. Now, for me, that's kind of extreme because I'm a conservative person. We walked all the way around it, and we prayed. God would give us a land. Within a year, they changed their mind. They decided they're not going to put a sales lot there. I thought, I knew you weren't going to put a sales lot. I could have told you that day one. I'm glad you came to that conclusion. And the church bought it. And we graveled it at first. And then we got the money to pave it. 
And then we kept growing. Then we bought the 2.2 acres next to us that the owner said was not for sale. I'd already been down this road once. I knew it was going to be for sale when we prayed. And then we bought the three acres beyond it that they said was not for sale. I'd already been through this twice. I'm going to tell you something. When you walk with God and have experiences in prayer, your faith will build every time. And Paul said, I pleaded with the Lord. And that's the action he took, and that's the action you need to take. And I don't care if it's three times or 30 times, you plead until God answers. And then there is the grace he received, the answer of the Lord, and the provision of the Lord is quite remarkable. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And look at this, my power is made perfect in weakness. Now here, God makes the word grace and the word power the same word. We always think of grace as an attitude of God, as the unmerited favor or the unconditional love of God. It means to give freely, but it also is a word of power. And then he says, my grace is sufficient. Archaeo in the Greek, that word actually means to, the power to ward off any danger or any threat. The ability to defend you against any danger or threat or attack. It also means to be competent. You ever felt like you weren't competent enough? You weren't competent for this job or maybe competent in your marriage or competent for this situation? I tell you, grace of God comes on your life, you'll be competent sufficient. You'll have enough is what it means. You'll have everything you need. When you live a life of faith and learn to seek the Lord, you're going to have a sufficient grace. And God said, it is my grace. It is only the grace of God. The only place you can find grace is from God. You can't find it from any person. You can't petition the government for grace. They can give us a stimulus check, but they can't give grace. You can come to a person for help, but they can't give you grace. You can go to the doctor for medicine, but he can't give you grace. You can go to the therapist for counsel, but he or she can't give you grace. There's only one place you can get grace, and that is from the throne of God. God says, it's my grace. And God gives it to those who seek him for it. Do you know that God has different kinds of grace, sufficient grace? Whatever your situation is, all of you are facing different situations in your life. You may be going through the best of times. You may be going through a very difficult time. There is a grace God has that's sufficient. There's, first of all, universal grace that everybody in the world enjoys. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 5, 45. He says that he, God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We're all blessed. We just took time today to say thank you. Amen. Universal grace. And then the early church had witnessing grace. You say, how, how could they keep testifying of Jesus when the culture of their day told them to be silent? That's the first cancel culture. Told them not to preach. But the Bible says in Acts 4, 33, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. The Bible talks about justifying grace. What if you went into court of law and they found you guilty, and somebody stood up and took your penalty? That would be incredible, wouldn't it? Well, that's what the word justification means. You were guilty in sin. Jesus took up and took your judgment, and God said, you're pardoned. You can go home. You're free. Justification. Justified. Pardoned. So I'd like to be pardoned from all my sins. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23 and 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace that came by Christ Jesus. There's a victorious grace. You want to be victorious in life and not be living a defeated, depressed life? Live on grace. It'll change your whole attitude toward life. Romans 5 and 17 says, how much more then will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life? Through the one man, Jesus Christ, you can reign in life. The Bible talks about a liberating grace in Romans 6 and 4. You're not under law, you're under grace. It's amazing how many of God's people still live under tradition and legalism. And the scripture says, you're not under law, you are under grace. The Bible talks about an inexhaustible grace. It says, is there any limit to it? No. The Word of God says in Romans 5 and 20, where sin did increase, grace increased all the more. The Bible talks about a working grace, a grace that works in a person to give you energy and power. 
Paul talked about it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I. But the grace of God that was with me. And the Bible talks about an enriching grace. Everybody would like to be rich and financially secure, but there, there are greater riches in this world than financial. There are spiritual riches. And Paul says that there's an enriching grace for your spiritual poverty in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. And you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And then there's a provisional grace. When you say, I don't know how we're going to have our needs met, look to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that at all times, in every way, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And the Bible talks about a saving grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. And the Bible talks about a preaching grace. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the nations the unsearchable riches of Christ. The Bible talks about a conversational grace. You ever been in a conversation? You didn't know what to say? You ever been in a business deal and you weren't sure what the right words to say were? You ever been in a court of law and not sure what to say? You know, in that moment, you can pause and ask God for conversational grace. The Word of God says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to answer anyone. Pause in that moment, ask for grace. You'll know how to answer anyone. The Bible talks about a helping grace in Hebrews 4 and 16. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of... It talks about a promotional grace. You want to get promoted at a job? You want to get promoted in your life? You want to get ahead? The Bible says in James 4 and 6, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The Bible talks about a growing grace in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it ends with a benediction. That means a word of blessing, grace. The Bible ends with grace. The last verse in the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. My grace is sufficient for you. Most importantly, it's a Christ-centered grace. Grace came into the world through the person and work of Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 17, the law was given by Moses. Religion can give you law. It can give you creeds. It can give you rules. It can give you regulations. But it can't give you grace. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace didn't come through Noah and the ark. Grace didn't come through Abraham and the covenant. Grace didn't come through Moses and the law. Grace didn't come through Buddha and the enlightenment. Grace didn't come through Muhammad and the Koran. Grace didn't come through Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Grace didn't come through the Renaissance and the age of reason. Grace doesn't come through religion. Grace doesn't come through good works. Grace doesn't come through the sacraments of the church. Grace doesn't come through baptism. Grace doesn't come through Holy Communion. Grace doesn't come through church membership. Grace came by Jesus Christ. Grace came in Bethlehem when the Son of God entered this world to save his people. Grace came at Calvary when Jesus died on the cross to take away the sins of the world. Grace came in the empty tomb when he rose from the dead and gave us eternal life. Grace came when he ascended to heaven as our great high priest. Grace will come when he returns at the end of the age as King of kings and Lord of lords. Grace came by Jesus Christ. 
and God has the grace you need if you will seek him. I pleaded with the Lord three times. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Anybody today living on grace, you can not only live by grace, you can live on grace. And then when he felt that grace, he talks about the strength he felt. You know, he felt better. He felt stronger when he let the thorn go. And you'll feel better when you let that thorn go and finally give it to God and trust him. To take it away or to take you through it. When the Lord spoke to him and he experienced that grace, he said, therefore, you know, you rise from real prayer different than you started. If you pray and touch the hem of his garment, you'll rise from that moment of prayer different than where you started. You'll feel differently. You'll feel better if you really pray. You hear from God. It's amazing the relief, the joy that comes through a few moments in the presence of God and you finally give it to the Lord and you realize you don't have to be so worried about it that his grace is sufficient. You don't know how it's going to work out. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You now know his grace is sufficient. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly. The J.B. Phillips translation says, I have cheerfully made up my mind. I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He said, I didn't think I was strong enough to get through it, but now I realize I've got plenty of the strength and power. I'm going to get right through this. I boast. That means I glory. I rejoice. Look at the praise he expressed. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight. The word delight there means I'm now content and satisfied. He was content when he heard from God. I hope you're the same way. When you get a promise from God, that should be enough to make it content and satisfied. You can leave the details to God. I delight, he said. I'm satisfied, I'm content in my weakness, not for my weakness. That would be absurd. That would be absurd to be happy about your weaknesses. Happy about your problems. I've heard people say that. Well, that's Christian joy. You should be happy about your problems. No, you shouldn't. That's not normal. You should be unhappy about your problems and happy about the promise of God. That's the source of happiness. I don't want any hard times. Anybody else like me? He said, I delight in my weaknesses, not for them. But in the middle of this, he said, my insults, hardships in ministry, persecutions, even difficulties... I delight, I'm content, I'm satisfied. I have found a place of perfect peace in the presence and promise of God. For when I'm weak in myself, then I am strong. Amen. Get up every day and say, when I'm weak in myself, I am really strong. I'm strong in his anointing. I'm strong in his blessing today. Get up every morning and say, I'm strong in his calling on my life. I'm strong in his defense I'm strong in his encouragement. I'm strong in his faithfulness. I'm strong in his grace. I'm strong in his help. I'm strong in his intercession. I'm strong in his joy. I am strong in his kindness. I'm strong in his love. I'm strong in his might. I'm strong in his name. I'm strong in his overflow. I'm strong in his power. I'm strong in his quickening of my soul. I'm strong in his righteousness. I'm strong in his strength. I am strong in his truth. I am strong in his understanding. I am strong in his victory. I am strong in his word. I'm strong in the zeal of the Lord. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Get up every day, no matter how you feel. Say, I feel weak right now, but I'm really strong. I'm going to face this day in strength. I've turned my weakness over to him. I receive his strength for this day. You see, when he gave God praise, he felt more powerful. Do you see that? When he said, I will boast, I'll delight. As soon as he uttered praise, he said, Christ's power rests on me. 
What Paul's thorn one was basically irrelevant, what he did about it is transforming. He pleaded with the Lord. He received grace. He felt a new surge of strength. He would write these words. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Would you join me for prayer this morning? What grace do you need today? Helping grace, healing grace, saving grace. God has a grace for you. In the stillness of this moment, I want you to plead with him. Ask him for help. Say, Lord, send me the grace I need in my life, in my family, in my business, in my ministry. Then I want you to confess by faith when I am weak, then I am strong. And the greatest grace is the saving grace I talked about, where God washes away your sins and gives you a new life. Jesus said you'll be born again when you put your faith in Jesus. By faith, receive Christ your Savior, and you'll receive the saving grace of God and have eternal life. I'd like to pray with you right now. For you to accept Christ, receive that grace of God that can save you from your sins and give you eternal life. Pray with me in faith these words. Lord Jesus, I do believe in you. You're the son of the living God. Lord, I confess my sins and I receive your forgiveness and your saving grace. Lord Jesus, I trust you now as my Savior and I openly declare Jesus is Lord of my life, and I pray this in your holy name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. What an amazing service we had. We pray the worship and the word of God minister to you in a powerful way. Today is Serve Sunday at Mount Perrin. As we are growing back from the pandemic we've all come through, people are returning to our campus. Every week, new people. You can be a blessing by serving today. You can check it out online. Check out the Mount Perrin app and let us know you want to serve. Go to the QR code you'll see today. It'll put your right to us how you can serve and be a blessing. This also today is an emphasis on our annual backpack campaign. We're providing this year backpacks full of school supplies for 2,000 children in six public schools. We also go into these schools and preach the gospel and have after-school Bible programs that students love learning the Word of God. Make a difference in the life of a child today. You can buy a pack online. If you're not able to pick one up here on campus and fill it up, we'll do all that for you. We just need to provide 2,000 backpacks. Get a backpack today. Bless a child. Thank you for your gracious support of the Mount Perrin ministry. We are part of the Mount Perrin family. Together, what we do, we do together. Your commitment is vital to our success and impact in the world. Thank you so much for your generous commitment, faithfulness to the kingdom of God. I pray you have an incredible week.